Well, thanks a lot. Hi, so my name is Anita Grasa. It's a pleasure being able to present here in front of you today. What I will be presenting is some work we did in the beginning of this year. So uh, before QGIS 2.0 was out. And um, it's about a comparison, obviously, between OpenStreetMap and the official Austrian reference graph street network in Austria. And I'll be showing you um, the toolbox that we developed and uh, the results of the comparison for the city of Vienna. Uh, if I talk we, uh, that would be uh, myself, then my colleague uh, Markus Straub, who is our uh, OpenStreetMap uh, expert, and my colleague Melita Dragashnik, who is our expert for the Austrian, street, uh, Austrian reference graph. Uh, to give you a short outline of what I've been talking about, uh, there is a short introduction into the different uh, concepts of street network modeling that those two street graphs follow. It's needed to understand a few of the results that I will be talking about later. Then I will show uh, which uh, comparison indicators have been used so far. There's quite a lot of studies on street network comparison. Notably a lot in the UK here, but also in Germany and the US and France, for example. So they have already introduced some indicators, which I have implemented also in the toolbox, and I will be showing the results for Vienna. Then we introduce uh, two new indicators, which are specific for vehicle routing. So we look at the quality of the street network for vehicle routing. It's important that the one-way street directions are correct and that they are modeled and that you have the turn restrictions which apply for the vehicles in the street network. So we have developed indicators to measure the correctness of those. Uh, I will end with the case study for Vienna before the conclusions. I'm quite sure for most of you the motivation is not something I have to dwell on for a long time. Street networks are just a really, really important input data set for all kinds of analysis. And uh, at AIT, where I work at the mobility department, we do, of course, a lot of analysis with traffic data. And you always need a street network. Or you almost always need a street network to do any kind of uh, real work. So of course, in a research setting, it's great to have OpenStreetMap because it's global. You can collaborate with any entity all over the world on a project. You can just share the data. It's free. You don't have to mess around with strange licenses. Can I give my street network to my partner in university YZ? Um, but of course, there's always been concerns, especially with the vehicle routing part, how far advanced is OpenStreetMap already? And can we use it uh, for our projects? I found this quote from 2012 applying to Germany, which basically says that well, yeah, no, it's not that great yet. There are not that many turn restrictions in it, like in the commercial data sets, and it will still take many years. So, But we decided we just have a look at it ourselves, and uh, we can go on from there. Short sneak peek, what was there in the end? Um, if you know Quantum GIS, QGIS, uh, and formerly Sextant, now renamed to Processing, <laughs> um, you can do all uh, you can create your own tools, which you put in the toolbox, and then you can chain them together to get analysis workflows. And uh, what I will be presenting is those uh, tools uh, that were necessary to do the uh, comparison between the OpenStreetMap and the gr Austrian graph. And there are all these tiny entries in the graph operations and graph comparisons. You can get them on GitHub. They are all out there. And try them out yourself if you're interested. Uh, so back to the street networks. OpenStreetMap, I'm sure you're all familiar with. Everyone can edit, everyone can use. On the other hand, there is the Austrian street network graph. It's created by the authorities, and currently there's really limited access to it. You cannot even go there and say, hi, I want to buy it. No, they don't have a business model yet, so you have to know someone who knows someone who can probably get you a copy of it. Uh, but that will hopefully change. Anyways, we, we got our hands on a copy, and that's uh, what I will be talking about. Another thing I'm sure many of you are aware of, that 
for these uh, mobility and routing applications, you need a routable network. And by default, OpenStreetMap is not routable. You cannot just take any export and run your Dijkstra routing algorithm on it. It will not work. You need to pre-process it. And that means on the lowest level that you have to split the edges at the intersections. Because in, street, in OpenStreetMap, it's perfectly fine to have an intersection model just with two edges instead of four, which you would normally have in a cross intersection like this one. By just having this one node in the middle shared between the two links, that says there is an intersection and you can turn and uh, everything is fine. But in, to use normal routing algorithms, you will have to split the edges here, make four edges out of it, which share the node. Another aspect of uh, street networks is the classification of the roads, which are important and which are less important. And in OpenStreetMap, there is the highway tag with these uh, names for different road classes. And in many commercial uh, street networks, they use a concept called functional road class, FRC. Uh, also in the Austrian street network, they use this. And it's usually from 0 to 8, plus they introduced some others, uh, 11 to 108, uh, which are pedestrian ways or something like that, which is not relevant for the study that I will be presenting. So we put them side by side and decide which, which classes match up approximately, and that's the um, result of this match, matching process. I will use these groups later on because they are comparable to show you some results. Another important aspect in street network modeling of OpenStreetMap and GIP where there's a big difference is in how the driving permissions are modeled. Uh, in OpenStreetMap, uh, you will have default driving permissions. So on a highway, it's usually not possible that you can cycle there. That would be forbidden implicitly. You don't have to specify it anywhere. And on the Austrian graph, which is called GIP, that's the abbreviation I use everywhere in the slides because the real name is way too long. They have uh, a co model the driving permissions using binary code. So there is a bit for every mode of transport, like for walking, for cycling, for, for cars, for taxis. There is, it has its own bit. And you will check for every direction of the road. Is it zero or one? Can I go there? Can I not go there? Is it a one way? Then it will be one in the one direction and zero in the other direction. And you have to kind of figure that out if you want to route on that graph. So that's two completely different ways of modeling the same thing. It's kind of similar with the turn restrictions by default in OpenStreetMap. If there's an intersection, you can turn. That's the default behavior. And then you can have explicit restrictions, which say you cannot go from A to B, but you can do everything else. Or you have uh, commands, which basically said here you can only turn from A to C, nowhere else. Uh, in GIP, it's again, everything is explicit. They have mo uh, entries in a list of turning um, relations, and everything that's not in this list is forbidden. So you can easily go through that list, and I will show you later how we use that. So that was the basics of the street networks, and now that we know those, we can compare the two. And the first part will be the indicators which are used in the literature so far. Uh, one basic indicator concerns itself with positional accuracy. Um, it's first uh, been used in the UK study by Mr. Hackley, and it uh, calculates the percentage of the low accuracy representation, so the network you want to test, uh, with the uh, distance in the high accuracy uh, representation uh, within a specified distance. I will explain it using the image, that's probably easier. Uh, so you have the high accuracy representation, that's the thinner line, and you specify certain uh, buffer distance in GIS speech, and you check from the network that you want to test how big is the percentage that falls within the buffer and is therefore positionally accurate and how much is outside that buffer zone. So I've implemented that in a tool for uh, sextante pro processing for quantum GIS. And you can basically see the parts coming together here. 
uh, you can read the models from the top down. There's always the, the reference graph that would be OpenStreetMap in our case. Uh, the buffer size, which you can vary depending on how generous you are with your definition of positionally accurate. Um, then there's the second graph, which you compare to, and I introduced a concept of regions. So you can do one in one go, analyze different regions at once. It's just an area, a layer, which you put in. And then it does all the, the buffering. The two um, differences are the faster way to dissolve currently. I found the dissolve operation takes just forever. But with the two differences, it runs much faster. So we dissolve all the buffers, and then we get the, the line length within the buffer and the total line length, and we can calculate the ratio. That's basically the result of the, uh, this tool. A second indicator that is also well used, I've just put a few studies on there, there's even more. They compare simply the, the network length per region. So they make cells and then they check how long is the OpenStreetMap network in it and how long is the other road network which we think is better or simply different. Uh, so here's for, for Nottingham. I found that in the Hackley study from 2010. And you can see there are some regions where OSM is longer than uh, the ordnance survey graph they used and other way around. Implemented in the toolbox, you have again two graphs that you put in. You have those regions again, and you compare the total graph length, and out it comes the difference between the two. And the resulting layer will then be those cells with an additional attribute of the road length difference. What's also been used in some studies is just uh, to look at attribute completeness, which of course is a another important aspect of the street networks. So they check uh, how big is the share of streets which have a name applied to them or for how big the percentage the names are still missing. Uh, that's also quite easy. In this case, you only need one graph because it's not a direct comparison in this case. Uh, you input the classification field and then the tool will check which streets uh, there is a null in, this, in that field and for which street there is some value in it and calculate the length for these two groups and compare them. Um, when it comes to the vehicle routing features like turn restrictions and one ways, what I found was only this one comparison by the German study which compared the number of turn restrictions. So you count them here, you count them there, you say when there is less than that's uh, worse than when there is more. But um, for the Austrian street network, that would not work. I already s explained how the modeling approaches are. So in the Austrian street network, everything is explicit. They would ex uh, explain this is forbidden, this is forbidden, this is forbidden. While in open street net, uh, OpenStreetMap, you could just say, at this intersection, it's only allowed to turn. You're only allowed to turn left. So there would be only one entry instead of possibly three or more. But it would have the same information. It would be equally correct. So just counting them does not work. You have to find a different solution. So we thought of some uh, more routing-based graph comparison uh, approaches. Um, there is a first preparation step, which is currently done with our in-house routing software, which extracts the, the one-way one streets and the turn restrictions from both graphs, and which is also used to calculate the shortest uh, paths. I will explain the concept in further detail on the next few slides. And the uh, evaluation which follows is then again done uh, in Quantum GS and Sixtante. So the first idea for turn restrictions was we can take the list of turn restrictions in the Austrian street network graph and we construct all those forbidden turns. The forbidden turns in this graph are the, the black arrows. So that's what you're not allowed to do. It always starts in the middle of one road link and ends in the middle of the next road link. So you have an easier time matching between different street network representations. 
Because if you put it just in an intersection, it will just not know where to put the starting point for the routing that we need to do. And the second, the colorful arrow that you see, that is the result of what happens when you root between the start and the end point of the forbidden geometry. Um, in the case where the other road network has the same knowledge of, about the turning restriction, it finds a way around the obs obstacle. And if it doesn't know about the turn restriction, it will just go happily go turn left because it doesn't know that it's not allowed to do that. So we generate both those uh, geometric representations and then we compare them. We say if they are too similar, it means that um, the turn restriction was ignored. It wasn't available in the data set. And uh, too similar, we've decided to define using Hausdorff distance, which is uh, implemented here in the model, uh, which basically just says um, the maximum of the minimum distances between the two data sets. It's easiest uh, to imagine on the graphic. I think it's a bit difficult to explain. Anyway, you get a maximum distance between the two, and we used a threshold of 15 meters. So if it's further than 15 meters apart, we say, that's different enough. It probably went a different route. It didn't uh, ignore the one way, uh, the turn restriction. So for the one-way streets, we used a similar approach. We again extracted the one-way geometries. In this case, just really short parts in the middle of the lines. Again, that's the forbidden uh, geometry, so to say. And we root it again. And on the left side, you see it finds a way around the one way because it knows about it. And on the right side, it doesn't know about the one way, and it just goes through. Uh, that's the model that does that. It just calculates export and add geometry columns, calculates the length of the lines, the ge line geometries. And we compare them because the extracts are always just 10 meters short. And if the uh, root resulting in the other graph is much longer, then we know that it found a way around it. And that the one way was modeled correctly in OpenStreetMap. So now that we know all the things that we did in theory, that's the case study for Vienna. It's the bigger Vienna region, so there's a lot of smaller towns around as well. And we looked at it on the December 2012 data. Um, for the positional accuracy, that's something uh, you can only do for selected roads. So we looked at, like in the British study, we looked at the highways in that region. And we varied the, the buffer size, so the definition of what is positionally accurate. And you can see that the positional accuracy of most of them is pretty good, even if you go to only 10 meters uh, from the center line of the geometry. There is a few... Um, bigger deviations, those are mostly only reaching into the analysis area for really, really short uh, parts. And there it gets difficult to distinguish between all those ramps and how, how they are classified. And it just gets messy there. And uh, I wouldn't give too much on those values. Um, then if you remember, I said network length. That's what everyone does. So we also did network length. Uh, and what you can see here are the classes that I uh, introduced before. So there's the highways and the trunk and the secondary and a lot of others and the tracks, which they later told us that they didn't include into the export that we got from the Austrian street network. So everything that's unpaved just wasn't in the export we received. So we omitted the group E for all further analysis. Uh, anyway, OpenStreetMap is still longer. In general, all the classes show the same thing. It's a bit longer than the Austrian reference graph. And that's because it is uh, the Austrian reference graph is more generalized. You, you, you can see here they would have just one edge where OpenStreetMap has two. And uh, it's just on a different level of generalization. So comparing the length <laughs> is, again, something that shows you an indicator. but. Uh, it doesn't tell you whether OpenStreetMap is better or worse than the comparison network. For attribute completeness, uh, we checked uh, names and speed values, so the max speed in OpenStreetMap. And uh, you can generally see that uh, there the authoritative network is, is more complete. 
Um, though it doesn't mean that it's correct still. And they have kind of uh, weird names like un unnamed street they would put in if some street doesn't have a name, versus OpenStreetMap probably wouldn't put anything. And in general, of course, the, the higher class roads are better covered. That's just to get an overview of the missing names, while the uh, authoritative street network is pretty much complete, completely named in the, inside the city of Vienna. You will still get some unnamed streets in, in OpenStreetMap, open street especially those which stick out here. Those areas are industrial zones where it's probably difficult to find the street name information. The turn restrictions, we also counted. So here are the counts. Uh, around 700 in OpenStreetMap and around 2,500 in GIP. So I already explained to you why, why that is not a really good comparison. Um, when we apply our routing-based comparison, then we get these results. We see that uh, in 95% of the cases, the one-way streets in OpenStreetMap and GIP would match. So if there is one in the Austrian reference graph, we find it represented in OpenStreetMap. And in 68% of turn restrictions, that's true as well. We also went out for a small region and checked on site because now we only know the differences. We don't know who's right and who's wrong. It could be either way. Uh, so we checked in the ninth district of Vienna, which is a rather small area. And there we found that the uh, OpenStreetMap errors, while they were more common, they were not, not all errors were in OpenStreetMap. There were also errors in the official reference uh, network. So in this case, uh, the official one had 20 to 30% failure rate of those differences. Um, of course, I also wanted to look at it, how it looks in space. I'm a bit sorry, in the print version, you can then hopefully read the numbers. But there's a lot of one-way one streets in Vienna. It always has three digits, and it's a one by one kilometer uh, grid. Uh, the darker, the better the match. So you see the white uh, cells around it where the comparison shows that they don't agree, those two street networks. While in the city of Vienna, it's rather dark and they agree well. Same for turn restrictions. There's generally fewer than one ways. But also here you say, see, the further you go outside the city, the, the less they agree, both street networks. Um, this is already going further than what you will find in the paper that goes with this talk, but we continued over this simple feature comparison to how to actually routing results on these two network graphs compare. And we chose the center of Vienna, those 10 by 10 cells in the center, and we uh, calculated routes in both graphs, so 10 per cell pair, making 99,000 routes and with an average length of uh, almost seven kilometers. And what you can see here is the distribution of length differences. So you would see if on the Aus official Austrian network uh, it's 10 kilometers long, then you have this distribution of lengths in OpenStreet network. And in general, the OpenStreetMap routes tend to be shorter. Um, not much, there's a mean difference of 17 meters. Um, that could be because there's more, sh more shortcuts or because it lacks some uh, restrictions so you can just find shorter routes which in practice are not allowed. Uh, but we need to look into more detail there. Um, that's if you wanted to define how many routes are similar and you put different thresholds, how many would match. And if you're very strict with only 10 meter threshold allowed, it would be 16% of those in average seven kilometer long, long routes. And you get go up to 60% almost for a 100 meter threshold. I'm wrapping up. Uh, so we did a comparison of OpenStreetMap and the Austrian reference graph for vehicle routing, a uh, focus on vehicle routing. We found that the open street network in this analysis area was 17% uh, longer than the official root network because it's less generalized, but the attribute completeness still, there's some catching up to do. The turn restrictions and one-way street information match by 95% and 70% approximately. And uh, you really get 
already a good match of the root length. So if your application is only dependent on the root length, it probably ma doesn't make much difference which street network you use. When you go down to the actual geometry of the roots, they might differ still, of course. So that's the toolbox. There's a link to, to GitHub where you can check it out. It's currently for uh, Sextante, so with Quantum GS 1.8. But of course, I'm planning to port it to 2.0 processing. And it's an open source uh, process for all the comparison parts. But for the preparation, there's still a bit lacking because that was done with some in-house tools. So there could be some chance for collaboration if someone would like to look into that. And then, of course, we are also interested in looking at other modes of transport besides cars. So if anyone sees, wants to talk about that later, you can find me around. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Anita. We've got about two or three minutes for questions. So does anyone have any questions for Anita at all? I wonder if there is uh, any way to Uh, to merge the attributes. Uh, for that, we would have to do a one-to-one -one matching of the street links. We haven't implemented that yet, but it can be found in the literature. It's explained how to do it. Uh, I'm very interested in doing that. So, yeah, it is definitely possible to some degree. You will have to check how good the results will be. Thank you. Uh, any other questions at all for Anita? A house of distance, yeah. yeah what what that? Describe it. Uh, the, the one uh, was the. There's two geometries basically, and you compare between the geometries where is the biggest uh, minimum distance. So you get from all the points in uh, geometry A to all the points in geometry B, and you check which is the closest one. And you do that for all combinations, and then for that list, you take the maximum. Okay. Yeah. That was <laughs> Okay. Anybody else? Last one. Is there any? No? Okay, thank you Thanks. very much, Anita. Okay, I can just leave that.